Adapted from archaic translation by W. H. D. Rouse. Jataka No. 263. Kala Palavana Jataka. Not through the sea, etc. This story the master told at Jetavana Monastery. Also about a backsliding brother. The master had him brought into the Hall of Truth. And asked if it were true that he was a backslider. Yes, said he, it was. Women, said the master, in olden days made even believing souls to sin. Then he told the story. Once upon a time Brahmadatta, the king of Banaras, was childless. He said to his queen, let us offer prayer for a son. They offered prayer. After a long time, the Bodhisattva came down from the world of Brahma, and was conceived by this queen. So soon as he was born, he was bathed, and given to a serving woman to nurse. As he took the breast, he cried. He was given to another. But while a woman held him, he would not be quiet. So he was given to a man's servant. And as soon as the man took him, he was quiet. After that men used to carry him about. When they suckled him, they would milk the breast for him, or they gave him the breast from behind a screen. Even when he grew older, they could not show him a woman. The king caused to be made for him a separate place for sitting or what not, and a separate room for meditation, all by himself. When the boy was sixteen years old, the king thought thus within himself. Other son have I none, and this one enjoys no pleasures. He will not even wish for the kingdom. What's the good of such a son? And there was a certain dancing girl, clever at dance and song and music, young, able to gain ascendancy over any man she came across. She approached the king and asked what he was thinking about. The king told her what it was. Let be, my lord, said she. I will allure him. I will make him love me. Well, if you can allure my son, who has never had any dealings whatsoever with women, he shall be king, and you shall be his chief queen. Leave that to me, my lord, said she, and don't be anxious. So she came to the people of the guard, and said, At dawn of day I will go to the sleeping place of the prince, and outside the room where he meditates apart I will sing. If he is angry, you must tell me, and I will go away. But if he listens, speak my praises. This they agreed to do. So in the morning time she took her stand in that place, and sang with a voice of honey so that the music was as sweet as the song, and the song as sweet as the music. The prince lay listening. Next day, he commanded that she should stand near and sing. The next day, he commanded her to stand in the private chamber, and the next, in his own presence. And so in due course desire arose in him. He went the way of the world, and knew the joy of love. I will not let another have this woman, he resolved. And taking his sword, he ran berserk through the street, chasing the people. The king had him captured, and banished him from the city along with the girl. Together they journeyed to the jungle, away down the Ganges. There, with the river on one side and the sea on the other, they made a hut, and there they lived. She sat indoors, and cooked the roots and bulbs. The Bodhisattva brought wild fruits from the forest. One day, when he was away in search of fruits, a hermit from an island in the sea, who was going his rounds to get food, saw smoke as he passed through the air, and descended beside this hut. Sit down until it is cooked, said the woman. Then her woman's charms seduced his soul, and brought it down from his mystic trance, making a breach in his purity. And he, like a crow with broken wing, unable to leave her, sat there the whole day till he saw the Bodhisattva coming, and then ran off quickly in the direction of the sea. This must be an enemy, thought he, and withdrawing his sword set off in chase. 
but the ascetic, making as though he would rise in the air, fell down into the sea. Then thought the Bodhisattva, the man is doubtless an ascetic who came here through the air. And now that his trance is broken, he has fallen into the sea. I must go help him. And standing on the shore he uttered these verses. Not through the sea, but by your magic power. You journeyed here at an earlier hour. Now by a woman's evil company. You have been made to plunge beneath the sea. Full of seductive lures, deceitful all. They tempt the most pure-hearted to his fall. Down, down they sink. A man should flee afar. From women, when he knows what kind they are. Whomso they serve, for gold or for desire. They burn him up like fuel in the fire. When the ascetic heard these words which the Bodhisattva spoke, he stood up in the midst of the sea, and resuming his interrupted trance, he rose through the air, and went away to his living place. Thought the Bodhisattva, the ascetic, with so great a burden, goes through the air like a fleck of cotton. Why should not I like him cultivate the trance, and pass through the air? So he returned to his hut, and led the woman among mankind again. Then he told her to be gone, and himself went into the jungle, where he built him a hut in a pleasant spot, and became an ascetic. He prepared for the mystic trance, cultivated the faculties and the attainments, and became destined for the world of Brahma. When this discourse was ended, the master explained the truths, became established in the fruit of the first path. Closing parenthesis. At that time, said he, I was myself the youth that had never had anything to do with women. Source. Adapted from archaic translation by W. H. D. Rouse. Jataka number 264. Maha Panada Jataka. It was King Panada, etc. This story the master told when he was settled on the bank of the Ganges, about the miraculous power of elder monk Badaji. On one occasion, when the master had passed the rains at Shravasti city, he thought he would show kindness to a young gentleman named Badaji. So with all the brethren who were with him, he made his way to the city of Badia, and stayed three months in Jatia Grove, waiting until the young man should mature and perfect his knowledge. Now young Badaji was a magnificent person, the only son of a rich merchant in Badia, with a fortune of eight hundred millions. He had three houses for the three seasons, in each of which he stayed four months. And after spending this period in one of them, he used to migrate with all his friends and family to another in the greatest pomp. On these occasions all the town was in flutter to see the young man's magnificence. And between these houses used to be erected seats in circles on circles and tiers above tiers. When the master had been there three months, he informed the townspeople that he intended to leave. Begging him to wait until the next day, the townsfolk on the following day collected magnificent gifts for the Buddha and his attendant brethren, and set up a pavilion in the midst of the town, decorating it and laying out seats. Then they announced that the hour had come. The master with his company went and took their seats there. Everybody gave generously to them. After the meal was over, the master in a voice sweet as honey returned thanks to them. At this moment, young Badaji was passing from one of his residences to another. But that day not a soul came to see his splendor. Only his own people were about him. So he asked his people how it was. Usually all the city was in a flutter to see him pass from house to house. Circles on circles and tiers above tiers the seats were built. But just then there was nobody but his own followers. What could be the reason? The reply was, My Lord, the Supreme Buddha has been spending three months near the town, and this day he leaves. He has just finished his meal, 
and is holding a discourse. All the town is there listening to his words. Oh, very well, we will go and hear him too, said the young man. So, in a blaze of ornaments, with his crowd of followers about him, he went and stood on the skirt of the crowd. As he heard the discourse, he threw off all his sins, and attained to high fruition and sainthood. The master, addressing the merchant of Badia, said, Sir, your son, in all his splendor, while hearing my discourse has become a saint. This very day he should either embrace the religious life, or enter nirvana. Sir, replied he, I do not wish my son to enter nirvana. Admit him to the religious order. This done, come with him to my house tomorrow. The Lord Buddha accepted this invitation. He took the young gentleman to the monastery, admitted him to the brotherhood, and afterward to the lesser and greater holy order of disciples. For a week the youth's parents showed generous hospitality to him. After remaining these seven days, the master went on arms pilgrimage, taking the young man with him, and arrived at a village called Koti. The villagers of Koti gave generously to the Buddha and his followers. At the end of this meal, the master began to express his thanks. While this was being done, the young gentleman went outside the village, and by a landing place of the Ganges he sat down under a tree, and plunged in a trance, thinking that he would rise as soon as the master should come. When the elders of greatest age approached, he did not rise, but he rose as soon as the master came. The unconverted folk were angry because he behaved as though he were a brother of old standing, not rising up even when he saw the eldest brethren approach. The villagers constructed rafts. This done, the master asked where Badaji was. There he is, sir. Come, Badaji, come aboard my raft. The elder monk rose, and followed him to his raft. When they were in mid-river, the master asked him a question. Badaji, where is the palace you lived in when great Panada was king? Here, under the water, was the reply. The unconverted said one to the other, Elder monk Badaji is showing that he is a saint. Then the master asked him to dispel the doubt of his fellow students. In a moment, the elder monk, with a bow to his master, moving by his mysterious power, took the whole pile of the palace on his finger, and rose in the air carrying the palace with him. Semicolon. Then he made a hole in it and showed himself to the present inhabitants of the palace below, and tossed the building above the water first one league, then two, then three. Then those who had been his family in this former existence, who had now become fish or tortoises, water snakes or frogs, because they loved the palace so much, and had come to life in the very same place, wriggled out of it when it rose up, and tumbled over and over into the water again. When the master saw this, he said, Badaji, your relations are in trouble. At his master's words the elder monk let the palace go, and it sank to the place where it had been before. The master passed to the further side of the Ganges. Then they prepared him a seat just on the river bank. On the seat prepared for the Buddha, he sat, like the sun fresh risen pouring on his rays. Then the brethren asked him when it was that elder monk Badaji had lived in that palace. The master answered, in the days of King Great Panada, and went on to tell them an old world tale. Once upon a time, a certain Saruchi was king of Mithila, which is a town in the kingdom of Videha. He had a son, named Saruchi also, and he again had a son, the Great Panada. They obtained possession of that mansion. They obtained it by a deed done in a former existence. A father and son made a hut of leaves with canes and branches of the fig tree, as a living for a Pacheka Buddha. The rest of the story will be told in the Saruchi birth, 
Book XIV. The master, having finished telling this story, in his perfect wisdom uttered these stanzas here following. Dash. It was King Panada who this palace had. A thousand bowshots distance high, in breadth sixteen. A thousand bowshots distance high, in banners clad. An hundred stories, all of emerald green. Six thousand men of music to and fro. In seven companies did they dance. As Badaji has said, it was even so. I, Saka, was your slave, at beck and call. At that moment the unconverted people became resolved of their doubt. When the master had ended this discourse, he identified the birth. Badaji was the great Panada, and I was Saka. Source. Adapted from archaic translation by W. H. D. Rouse. Jataka No. 265. Karapa Jataka. When many a bow, etc. This story the master told in Jetavana Monastery, about a brother who had lost all energy. The master asked, was it true that this brother had lost his energy? Yes, he replied. Why? asked he. Have you slackened your energy, after embracing this teaching of salvation? In days of past, wise men were energetic even in matters which do not lead to salvation. And so saying he told an old world tale. Once upon a time, while Brahmadatta was king of Banaras, the Bodhisattva was born into the family of a forester. When he grew up, he took the lead of a band of five hundred foresters, and lived in a village at the entrance to the forest. He used to hire himself out to guide men through it. Now one day a man of Banaras, a merchant's son, arrived at that village with a caravan of five hundred wagons. Sending for the Bodhisattva, he offered him a thousand pieces to be his guide through the forest. He agreed, and received the money from the merchant's hand. And as he took it, he mentally devoted his life to the merchant's service. Then he guided him into the forest. In the midst of the forest, up rose five hundred robbers. As for the rest of the company, no sooner did they see these robbers, than they groveled upon their belly. The head forester alone, shouting and leaping and dealing blows, put to flight all the five hundred robbers, and led the merchant across the wood in safety. Once across the forest, the merchant encamped his caravan. He gave the chief forester choice meats of every kind, and himself having broken his fast, sat pleasantly by him, and talked with him thus. Tell me, said he, how it was that even when five hundred robbers, with arms in their hands, were spread all around, you felt not even any fear in your heart. And he uttered the first stanza. When many a bow the shaft at speed let fly, hands grasping blades of tempered steel were near, when death had marshalled all his dread. Why, mid such terror, felt you no dismay? On hearing this the forester repeated the two verses following. When many a bow the shaft at speed let fly, hands grasping blades of tempered steel were near, when death had marshalled all his dread. I felt a great and mighty joy this day. And this my joy gave me the victory. I was resolved to die, if need should be. He must contemn his life, who would fulfill heroic deeds and be a hero still. Thus did he send on his words like a shower of arrows. And having explained how he had done heroically through being free from the desire to live, he parted from the young merchant, and returned to his own village. Where after giving alms and doing good he passed away to fare according to his deeds. When the master had ended this discourse, he explained the truths, and identified the birth. At the conclusion of the truths the disheartened brother attained to sainthood. At that time I was the chief of the foresters.